when Corey D. Williams accompanied his father, Billy D., to the set of Return of the Jedi, he had no idea he would end up as the skiff guard alien Klaatu battling Luke Skywalker after he had ignited the green in my favorite scene of all time. You know, we're playing a guessing game every day to figure out what was going on. And when we first got there, they had these T-shirts that they handed us that said Blue Harvest on them and hats and stuff. And I said, what is Blue Harvest? I thought we came here to shoot Star Wars, you know? (laughs) (laughs) Dad! (laughs) And I was like, okay, what, you know, what in the world is this? So then after a while, you know, I found out that, well, they were trying to sort of cover up the fact that we were shooting Star Wars there. So we all had this different stuff to wear that threw people off a little bit. But I'm, but I was thinking at the same time, you know, what are they going to do when they see my father, um, Harrison Ford, and Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher <laughs> together <laughs> eating dinner? You know, it's going to get pretty obvious because <laughs> this was a pretty small town that we were in, you know. This is Steel Wars episode 150. Corey D. Williams, tales from battling Luke Skywalker above the Sarlacc pit and what to do when your dad betrays Han Solo. This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. As well as the Making Star Wars Podcast Network. Hey guys, welcome to Steel Wars. I am comedian Steel Saunders and I do love Star Wars. And each week we talk to someone of interest about it. And this week we have got a very special guest. It is always exciting when we've had someone that's actually been in the universe. They've made that painful jump onto the screen through the camera and they're here to relate their amazing stories of that adventure. Welcome to the podcast. A man that portrayed the often underlooked character of Klaatu. On Jabba's sail barge, <laughs> it is Corey D. Williams. How you doing, buddy? <laughs> All right, man. <laughs> yeah, Klaatu is a pretty obscure character for sure. He is, but it depends when you came up in Star Wars. Because I'm a child of Return of the Jedi, and, and Klaatu was a pretty common action figure on the pegs at that time. And he also yeah. had he had that, that, that sweet little skirt, which I appreciated. <laughs> and for me, just because he was in my action figure collection, which, which wasn't that big back then, he, he is a pretty important character... In in the action that was going on in my backyard, maybe not so much on uh, in Tatooine in Return of the Jedi, but back yeah. in, back in Australia in uh, a little <laughs> town called Rosebud in the backyard of my house, he was he was neck deep in the action, my man. <laughs> yeah, I guess it it was kind of more of an apron than a skirt, but yeah. <laughs> I didn't mean to cause any offense. Don't get all don't get all prickly about it. Don't get all prickly about it. You're like, oh, nice purse. It's a man bag, okay? Yeah. <laughs> all right, well, let's let's go along this. If it's a if it's an apron, what's he cooking? What's he cooking, Corey D. Williams? Give me the backstory. I looked on Wikipedia. I didn't see any chefing experience at all. Uh, he's probably cooking up part of uh, Jabba the Hutt's tail. <laughs> do you, do you think... Whatever's left of it anyway after the ship exploded. Huts Hutt, would have to taste disgusting, yeah? Yeah, they probably you'd probably need a lot of salt or something or some kind of <laughs> cream sauce or something. Or, or the... guy's probably gamey. Yeah, or the answer to, to anything for me is just drip it in barbecue sauce. There you go. Anything tastes good dripping. Barbecue hut. Barbecue sauce. Those hut ribs, they would be big and delicious. That's like a a Fred Flintstone style meal. Oh, man. That'd be some tough eating there, man. (laughs) (laughs) Now, I'm actually 
on it's it's coming up to uh, Thanksgiving, and we're doing a bit of a, a Thanksgiving road trip out, um, sort of through a few states, and we're actually passing through Yuma, Arizona. And I'm, uh-huh. I've hired someone to take me out and see this, uh, where they actually filmed the scenes you were in in Return of the Jedi. What, mm-hmm. what, what tips would you give me for heading out into that desert? What's actually left out there? I have no idea. Did they, did they leave up stuff, or are you just going to be looking at a pile of sand, going that this is where it was? <laughs> Listen, Corey, I don't belittle your lifestyle. <laughs> you and your apron. So if I want to go out and look at some famous sand, let me, okay? <laughs> you know, I don't even, I can't even imagine how you even, I guess, you know, everybody knows exactly where it was, but there was a fence around the perimeter of the set um, at one point. I don't know if the fence is still there or, or even how much of the set still remains. It'd be pretty interesting to see, I would think. Um, well, from what I but- know, the fence <clears throat> the fence is gone, but you can still find the like the the concrete where they were into. Like I think they just chopped the fence posts down, and you can still see like the like where they are where they hit the ground. And 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 from what I've read, if you dig around, and I am prepared. You can find maybe a bit of foam from the sarlacc or something. So I am I'm going out there. But either way, uh, much to my wife's chagrin, I am taking a few uh, large jars or small buckets, depending on your interpretation. And I'm I'm bringing back a chunk of Tatooine. Don't worry about that. I'm I'm, I'm bringing some Tatooine back to LA. Man, I would I would put some of that sand in a jar and. So that'd be a fun thing to have, actually. If I, yeah, know, I'm send, uh, me, send me one if you get an extra one. All right, I'll, I'll, <laughs> I'll hit you with some sand. It's it's um, it's <laughs> maybe not the uh most normal thing. It's like, oh, what'd you get in the mail today? Well, I got a phone bill, and some Australian <laughs> idiot sent me some sand. <laughs> and who knows where you got it, right? Just, he just went to Malibu somewhere and threw some sand and tried to say, Yeah, I was, I was in New Arizona. And- <laughs> yeah, and you, you you open up the envelope and sniff it, and you go, ah, that Yuma sand. I remember yeah. it well. <laughs> but what yeah. was it like? Was the experience of being out there like I'm a bit worried about the heat. Like, does that bring back like the the heat of it bring back negative feelings, or it was just so fun out there? Well, you know, it was the kind of thing that you got used to. You know, it was. It was pretty hot. Um, I don't think it was like I was reading the other day that it was I can't even remember like what month it was or um, but I think they were saying it was like in April or something like that. So I guess it wasn't probably as hot as it could have been, but it was still over 100 degrees like every day. I mean, so you can imagine, I mean, when you start putting on it's fine if you're walking around, you know, in a pair of shorts and a T-shirt or something, but. When you start putting on a costume and you start putting a latex rubber mat- mask over your head, um, you know it's 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 not as fun as it could be. <laughs> Let's put it that way. <laughs> well, you know, there's there's Jenny Craig, there's Weight Watchers, and then there's right. the, the Klatu diet, which is just <laughs> days of endless sweating that will get you trimmed down. Well, I tell you, I mean, I really didn't, I really couldn't complain because being a Gomorian guard uh, or being um, Chewbacca was, uh, sure, I'm sure it was pretty miserable for Peter. Um, I'm sure, I know he's pro- he probably done it at other locations where, you know, that, because that suit's, a, it's just a big fur suit you got on and putting on a fur suit in over 100 degree weather out there is, <clears throat> you know, for sure, it's probably like a walking sauna. <laughs> yeah. Know? Oh, you'd uh, you, you'd come out leaner. You'd come out leaner. You definitely. Yeah. <laughs> you have to do everything you can to stay hydrated and not, you know, sweat out every you know bit of water from your body you possibly could have. Yeah, you'd definitely be making weight for that week's uh, UFC fight. You'd 
You'd, yeah. you'd be feeling <laughs> lean. You'd be feeling lean. Now, what what got you out there to the Sarlacc pit? You were, you were originally going to be a, a stand-in for, for your dad, Billy D, if I'm correct? Yeah, you know a lot, man. You got some details there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, basically, they uh, he asked me if I wanted to come out and um, – work as a stand-in for him, and um, I reluctantly said yes. <laughs> reluctantly? No! <laughs> yeah, everybody thinks it. I mean, that's a crazy part of the story. It's like, you know, of course Star Wars was very popular back then, but it now it's sort of reached sort of a legendary status that, you know, it didn't quite have then, but still... You know, when you when you've been on a few movie sets and you know what movie shoots are like, it's it's not um, it's not a glamorous thing. I mean, it's it can be really tedious and kind of really boring. And, you know, you're just kind of sitting there while people do the same shot over and over again. And so, you know, there's all that. Plus the 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 heat that I knew we were going to have to endure out there. And I was like, hmm. And plus, we were working with Stephen Costantino, who actually ended up going with me, um, was a guitar player in my in our band that we had together. And um, he and I were working on an album at the time for our band that we had called Atmosphere, um, trying to finish up some music so that we could submit. And so re- getting a record deal at that point was kind of like a huge priority in my life. And I didn't want to have to stop doing what I was doing to go do anything else at the, at the time. But then he then my father suggested, well, why don't you bring Stephen along and then you guys can you can work and then you can continue working on your music, you know, while we're not working. And I was like, man, that sounds like the best of both worlds. And I don't have to miss going and then I can still continue working on music. So that's kind of how it happened. I said, OK, yeah, you can bring Stephen. I was like, there you go. I'm in. Oh my God! You get to go to a galaxy far, far away while working on your uh, dreams of being a rock star. That's uh, that's qu- yeah. That's quite an April. That is quite an April, or whatever month it was. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I guess you could say that, right? <laughs> now, when you were out there, were you like? When we see like clips now of, of of new scenes from from the upcoming films, and we 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 desperately try to put together, you know, what's going on? Why is Ray saying that? Why is she holding this? Why is she looking that way? Like, were, were you much of a fan of the previous two films? And of course, your dad was in the the, the previous one, The Empire Strikes Back. Were you, were you right. sort of on set, sort of like going? All right, Luke's in black. Lee is a dancer. Dad's got a bone helmet. What's going on? Uh, yeah, <laughs> pretty much. I mean, oh uh, yeah, I was a huge Star Wars fan. Actually, I mean, I loved the movies. Um, saw them multiple times, and um, but yeah, I mean, you know, they didn't even give you very many details when you're working on, uh, you know, when you're working on the movie like that. You know, I don't think. I don't think I ever saw any section of the script that didn't have anything to do with what we were doing, but um, <clears throat> so it's kind of hard to figure all that stuff out. But uh, yeah, we just kind of, you know, we were pl- playing a guessing game every day to figure out what was going on. And when we first got there, they had these um, T-shirts that they handed us that said Blue Harvest on them and hats and stuff. And I said, what is Blue Harvest? I thought we came here to shoot Star Wars. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Dad! <laughs> and I was like, okay, what, you know, what in the world is this? So then after a while, you know, I, I found out that, well, they were trying to sort of cover up the fact that we were shooting Star Wars there. And um, so we all had this different stuff to wear that, threw people off a little bit, but I'm, but I was thinking at the same time, you know, what are they going to do when they see, you know, uh, my father, um, Harrison Ford and Mark Hamill and Carrie Fisher (laughs) together (laughs) eating dinner, you know, it's going to get pretty obvious (laughs) because this was a pretty small town that we were in, you know, there weren't a lot of places to go. Yeah. So it wasn't, it didn't take long for people to figure out what was going on. They knew what was up. 
Well, it's strange. They they brought out this <clears throat> Return of the Jedi like poster trivia book when uh, the film came out, and I remember having all the you know pulling out all the posters and sticking them next to my bed. I remember there was a, a Gamorrean guard, and I was fascinated with what the you know the green pig man was going to be up to in the film. But they had a little yeah. trivia quiz in this uh, sort of fold out poster book, and one of the trivia things was that the code name was Blue Harvest and they had the little logo and it's sort of the first bit of kind of background information I ever like yeah. that that I ever it- sort of remember ever learning and I was so young I didn't quite understand like I was sort of like yeah but when's that Blue Harvest film going to come out like are they in this <laughs> like I didn't quite click what was going on but if only <laughs> at first that was yeah like... <laughs> if only when they explained to you what the um the fake t-shirts were about that someone also explained to you what ebay was going to be in uh about 30 years because <laughs> right <laughs> those t-shirts are, are quite coveted these days yeah, I mean, what is what? I have no idea what one of those goes for on eBay. I don't even have mine anymore. I think Steven still has his. He he keeps everything. I don't know what happened to mine. Somebody, pro- one of my friends, probably ripped me off. <laughs> 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 the interesting thing about how you're saying with the code name and and then the fans ended up sort of finding out. It was kind of, you know, one of the few times that. Star Wars fans kind of got to be on set, like actually be on a fence and and look out to see where Star Wars was being filmed. There's been like because of the the fantastic locations that the films are set in. There's been very few times where you know, like just looky loos can uh, do that. We, yeah. we I spoke to. Uh, a guy in England <clears throat> that when they were filming <clears throat> The Force Awakens, he found out they were filming at a um, like a, a park quite near him, and he, he him and his friend just left work and drove to Greenham Common where they were filming the Resistance base and didn't tell anyone. And I, I loved, I admired that because I'd like to think that's what I'd do if I found out Star Wars was filming down the road. I'd just drop everything, leave work and, and drive down there. But what was it like with the fans <laughs> all uh, scouring the fence down there? <laughs> it was pretty crazy. Some days it was pretty crazy, but, you know, they tried to, it was a pretty remote location. I guess it was sort of like near the border of California and Arizona and Mexico was probably nearby too. But, I mean, at any given moment, you could have, you know, 20 or 30 dune buggies or, you know, ATVs just <laughs> coming over the dune. So they, just, you know, they tried to sort of keep it as secret, as much of a secret as they could, because, you know, when you're shooting, that kind of stuff can disrupt filming quite a bit. Mm-hmm. Um, you got, you know, Hans trying to do his dialogue and you hear a dune buggy in the, band, in the background. You know? <laughs> so, so, um, but I think people, you know, once people knew what was going on, a, a lot of people showed up, but I think a lot of them were kind of respectful of what was going on. And I'm sure they had their nightmares, though, but I don't remember anything significant with that. I just think that I do remember a lot of people showing up sometimes and, you know, and being sort of in the distance. But they had this set that was built up so high. It was two or three stories off the ground, I guess. And, you know, you couldn't, you, you, all you could basically see was like the horizon in the distance. Uh, um, so it sort of blended into the sand dunes that are far away in the background. And because um, a lot of this stuff was done before, you know, all this huge CG stuff that they're doing now. Um, so they really had to get a lot of the stuff was like real shots. Yeah. The, the the set though, to actually, you know, for the people that did get to a dune buggy out there. And I did find out that it is, it is, it is very unwise to walk out there. Uh, I've been told by uh, several locals I, I talked to on the phone, so I won't be doing that. I've got a, a dune buggy that's going to take me out there, but the set just looks so 
fantastic to see in person, like the actual sail barge set, how much they actually built that. Uh, what was that like to be like sort of interacting on this giant sort of Star Wars play set, as it were? Yeah, I mean, really, it was crazy. I mean, I was pretty pretty much in awe the first time I saw it. I mean, we drove, we, it was probably, I want to say maybe over an hour or so away from the hotel we were staying. And so it was a pretty long drive to get to it every day. But I remember the first time we went to it, we just sort of pulled off the road and there was just a bunch of sand. And I'm thinking, okay, where are we going? You know, I don't see anything. And we, they sort of wet down sand to sort of pack it down and make sort of like a road that went out to it. And as we drove between these two sand dunes, the set just sort of came up out of nowhere. And I was just like, oh, wow. I mean, it was just, it was massive. I mean, you you know, you just picture Jabba Sail Barge um, at, you know, to scale. I mean, it was the actual size of the sail barge. <laughs> I mean, sitting there, although you can only see it from one side, it was built to be half of it. So they only shot it from one side, one angle. And the other angle was you could basically see the framework, which allowed you to just kind of like see into it. Mm -hmm. And the whole thing was very elaborate. It was a very elaborate set. I mean, I'm, 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 I was told it took them a long time to, to put everything together before we got there. But, um, I mean, there was an airbag at the bottom of the set. So when you fell into the Sarlacc pit and rolled down the side, you went into an airbag, which was in a tunnel down below the set. And you would kind of crawl out once you once you got once you hit the airbag and were down in the hole. So it was, uh, you know, it was really, really interesting to see all that stuff. They actually had um, some speeders out there that they were working on for the scene that they were going to work on in the forest. And, um, but, you know, it was amazing when you look at some of that stuff, it, it, you, it looks real, but when you get up close to it, it's like you start recognizing bits and pieces <laughs> of different things. Like, wait, that's a carburetor. Wait, hold on a second. That, is that at the head of a shovel? I mean, you know, it's like, <laughs> it's ingenious stuff. You know, they, they put together all these different, bits and pieces from um actual cars and what have you and really make stuff that looks like it, you, you want to sit on it and you think it could actually start up and fly you know now you were saying that you know the time on set can sometimes be you know quite arduous when you know you're doing retake 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 and then you know we have to also consider this is a retake of Luke Skywalker slashing an alien with his lightsaber. So they're pretty, you know, exciting retakes. But did it surprise you? Yeah, how long were you out there for? Uh, I think it was several weeks, a couple of weeks, I believe. When you saw the film and you're seeing all the different shots getting filmed, you know, very clinically apart... Like the the Sarlacc pit battle, that's my favorite scene in all of Star Wars. And did it surprise you when you actually saw the film with the John Williams music and the fast editing and the special effects, just how exciting like that scene was? Well, you know, I, I grew up doing um, editing and I had a lot of experience editing and doing film, short films when I was really young and in junior high school, we actually had a film course. In high school, we had a film course. And so, you know, I knew a lot about how films go together. And I'd been on several other sets, you know, with my father before. So I knew, you know, that how different it could look when you're shooting than, than the raw footage. I mean, sometimes they would have what they call dailies when you go in and you watch uh, the footage from the day. And, um, you know, they decide whether or not what they have is good enough to keep or if they want to reshoot things and so forth. But so, yeah, I was pretty familiar with the process. And so that whole, that aspect of it didn't surprise me a lot, but it was really, um, you know, great to see how all the effects came together because I don't think I'd ever been in work involved in anything that was, uh, that heavily, you know, uh, done with a, a lot of effects in it like that. Um, so that was the, that was really the most interesting thing 
about it. But you know, when you're filming, you just it's it's just a lot of bits and pieces, and you're doing all these bits and pieces, and sometimes you, they're not even in any particular order or sequence that you're doing these bits and pieces in. So it is a little bit surprising to see how all the bits and pieces come together if you don't really know the totality of what, what the scene is supposed to be like and what's supposed to happen in the scene, which we really didn't know a lot. You know, like when I got to do Clat 2, they just kind of asked me to put the costume on. Like I had, I wasn't there to do that. I was there to do stand-in work. And um, it, that just kind of happened as a result of them needing uh, another body. I mean, a lot of people, <laughs> a lot of people got hurt on the set. There was so much action going on in that one scene so you know we you you got all these bits and pieces of action and then like you say they're going to put everything together in quick cuts and um so you know there was there like this one point where i run towards skywalker and he cuts my instrument the uh weapon that i have that i'm attacking him with uh, in half and then i just turn around and sort of leave but <laughs> so you know that we we might we may have spent uh, you know half a day working on or several several hours working on that one thing that goes by so quick in the film that if you blink if you blink your eye you could miss it. Like it, it appears, all the scenes that you were in were actually out at Yuma. There was no sort of studio work. No, I didn't do anything other than what what, what was done at Yuma. Um, they did. I I almost went. Because I think some of the some of the Ewok stuff was in the area of Northern California, I believe. But mm-hmm. um, so I almost went with them to do that, but that didn't end up working out. Um, I didn't end up going to do that, or I probably would have ended up with some sort of stormtrooper <laughs> uniform on or something, you know. <laughs> oh, an Ewok basketball player, one of the two. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, an Ewok basketball player. Just, right? a, just a really tall one. Just a really, really yeah. tall one. No, I don't think they had too many tall Ewoks in the film. <laughs> nah, I think they call them Wookies. I hope you guys are enjoying this really fun interview with Corey D. Williams. And if you want to help as many people as possible celebrate our 150th episode, please retweet the episode announcement that's pinned to the top of our Twitter and Facebook feeds. It is listener word of mouth that builds up our audience and i cannot thank you enough for doing so also while you're at it get onto itunes and leave us a sweet 150th episode five star review thanks now how old were you when you were doing this uh about 22 years old yeah yeah. nice so was it uh a thrill that you sort of got you know, called out to do this clatu. you know, you're there just to stand in for your dad. And then, you know, the next year you've got an, an action figure of the character you portrayed. Were you uh, excited by that or? Well, the funny thing is that you mentioned it. I really had no idea there was even an action figure. I didn't, I didn't know anything about it really. Um, (laughs) (laughs) Believe it or not, I didn't find out that there was an action figure until probably like the, I don't know. It was. It might have been like the thirtieth anniversary of Return of the Jedi. (laughs) 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 Which is, which is, which is how I wound up doing conventions. Actually, Um, uh, our manager uh, Derek Mackey, who manages my father at conventions and sets all that stuff up for him. He asked me if I wanted to do some cons and I was like, eh, I don't know, you know, I don't know if I, if I'm, if I'd be too freaked out, you know, sitting there and, and probably have people know more about Star Wars than I do. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, he asked me, um, you know, he saw a photograph of Steven and I that I had in, um, in my gym. I have a fitness trainer. I've been a fitness trainer for 25 years. And so I have this photograph in my, training studio and um it's me with the clad two mask down in front of me and steven standing next to me in a gamorian guard outfit and um he saw it and derek saw it and he says you know like a lot of people would probably be interested in in the you know having that signed or like uh in your character in general probably i believe it's an action figure and you haven't been signing and i was like are you kidding me 
an action figure, what? <laughs> so he said, well, let me do some research and let me get back to you. So he did some research. He got back to me and said, yep, indeed, it's an action figure, man. And people collect those things and you have not been signing them. And I was like, what? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I was pretty terrified about going to a con and sitting there and signing autographs. But, you know, after I did it the first time or two, it got to be easier and people were really nice and it's kind of fun. And, you know, another reason why I kind of agreed to go out and do it is because when my when my father's there, we get to spend time together, which, you know, otherwise is sometimes very difficult with us living on opposite ends of the galaxy here and, and um, you know, doing both of us doing our own thing all the time. So it was kind of like a good excuse to spend some time with him and that's awesome. And you know, and I hang out with fans and stuff, which is which I really enjoy because I'm a huge fan myself. I'm, so it's just really fun to hang out with other people that are that are into it, it's way more into it than I am for sure. But and yeah. it it seems like you've really taken to the fun of the conventions. Like you you've got a, a couple of tracks up on YouTube that the Cloud City Funk uh, sort of <laughs> series of, of tunes and like it it's sort of like you know, really fun, you know, music with the sort of, I guess the video clip is of you sort of, sort of engaging with all the crazy different costume characters and, and yeah. it, it's a really good, I, I watched the one from Orlando where I was and it actually made me a little bit Orlando homesick. Not that, like, just because it was, like, all the same. Like, oh, I know where they are in that hotel. And I remember seeing that costume. And I got very, uh, oh, I want to go back to Celebration. It was, it was so much fun. How did how did all that come about? Well, that's a nice segue you made, by the way, there. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a pro! <laughs> yes, you are. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, man, you know, Star Wars Celebration is just a lot of fun anyway. I mean, I actually got this, the first year I actually went to one, I was actually, they brought me there to sign. And, you know, they don't bring everybody there to sign. It's kind of an honor to be asked to sign. I mean, yeah, everybody wants to sign at a celebration who's ever been in Star Wars. But, you know, I'd been to a, a few cons and I'd never really seen... Uh, that much sort of enthusiasm for Star Wars in one place. I mean, you know, you're talking hundreds of thousands of people over a weekend coming to the thing. So it's pretty ginormous and like pretty exciting thing to be a part of. But uh, but yeah, this the second year um, that that um, I, I didn't get to go the following year. Um, uh, they didn't, you know, you usually don't get to go out to those things very often. It's like and plus, Cloud 2 is such an obscure character that, you know, once in a while is pretty much more than enough. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, I'm not, it's not like I'm Mark Hamill or, you know, Billy I, D. Williams or something. There's, there's only so many replica aprons you can sign. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> or, you know, there's only so many um, uh, Clad 2 uh uh, toys in existence, right? To be signed, but you know, I signed posters and all kinds of stuff too. But, but anyway, yeah, the second, the, the year, the following year, I want to say, um, I wasn't supposed to be going, but we had a we had a song that we a groove that we did that um, have a project, the music project called 3D Nucleus, and what we do is we create music through. Um, improv we get together and maybe two or three of us will start playing something and then we record everything that we play and then I go through and I edit all the best bits and pieces of what we do so there was one sort of groove that we did where um, James Wen who's um, the second who's our drummer plays with us all the time he was playing this sort of, he has, an, he has a rolling kit, it's an electronic kit, and he was playing this sort of Star Wars-y vibe thing, and we were playing on it, and just sort of, um, he and I, and the other bass player, and and um, Curtis Combo and um, Matt Williamson, we were, we were all sitting there kind of jamming on this thing, and 
and after we listened, we didn't really realize how sort of space sound, spacey sounding it was at the time. We were just like, that's, you know, we listened back to it. And it's like, man, that's like intergalactic funk. Like, what is going on with it? <laughs> I, said, love, I love that after you listen to it, like, guys, this <laughs> funk is not of this galaxy. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's not like we're sitting around, you know, going, hey, let's do a bunch of Star Wars grooves, you know. <laughs> that that would be way too obvious. So <laughs> we, we weren't even thinking about that at the time, but it just kind of happened like that, sort of. And um, um, Jamie Stangroom, um, he, he uh, he's um, with the BBC. You know him, right? Yeah, yeah, I know Jamie, yeah. Yeah, Jamie asked me if um, I had a piece of music. He was going to do a Cloud City parody with my father. And um, I said, yeah, I think I have something that would fit just right. (laughs) (laughs) As a matter of fact. (laughs) So he said it would be because he knew I had a music project and he was like, it would be great to have some of your music in the parody in the background. And I was like, yeah, I'm I'm totally down with that, man. So... um, I gave him the track and I said, you let me know if you want me to do anything to it or if you think it fits. And he heard it and he was like, man, I think that's perfect. So, you know, I mixed it up. Um, um, one of the other members of our of our um, project, Matt um, Williamson, is a sound engineer. And he and I both have a lot of experience mixing and recording. So we get together and we do a lot of final mixes together. It's kind of cool to have somebody else to bounce ideas off of too. But, um, but yeah, we did a final mix, sent it to Jamie. He put it in the parody and then that was kind of that. And then we were just thinking, man, it would be really cool to shoot a video around this song and somehow use some of the footage from the parody and other Star Wars related footage. And wouldn't it be cool if we went to celebration (laughs) and shot it, I was like, now, you know, where else can you find that many people dressed up in a star Wars costume? Nowhere. I mean, (laughs) so I thought, wow, this would be the perfect opportunity to kind of get together and, um, and, uh, you know, create some sort of video that, but I didn't want it to look polished or anything or like be like a production. I wanted it to seem, like almost like you could have done it on your cell phone or something, you know, just very um, raw and fun and spontaneous. So we didn't really have much planned. Um, we just kind of were made it up as we went along. And um, I have a lot of friends who are in the 501st Legion who mm-hmm. started hitting up people and saying, hey, you're going to be there. What are you wearing? And when are you going to be wearing it? And on what day? <laughs> It's crazy the the costumers that do take like it's a four day con or whatever, and they've got I oh, well, you got to take four four costumes for that. Like that is yeah, that is just such <laughs> like dedication to doing that. One of my favorite shots because it is one of my favorite just silly things about Star Wars conventions is you're next to the escalator and you've got all the Wilro hoods sort of going around like down <laughs> and up. And I, I like I love the whole spirit behind Wilro Hood, which I, most people listening will know, but he's like a guy in an orange jumpsuit. And when Lando Carizian says evacuate, he runs in the background with a an actual yeah. 1979 model ice cream maker. And, yeah. I, and I think because we had so long to watch these three films without any other films, like we really like stared in the background, like more than any film's ever been like analyzed in the background. And, you know, someone's like, oh, oh, here's this guy. Oh, it looks like he's got an ice cream maker. And then someone goes, oh, no, that is, we've investigated this. This is actually an ice cream maker. So at conventions, you'll see like a running of the Wilro Hood and they'll try to get as many people as possible that have cosplayed as him, um, like sort of run through, like evacuate, which... I just think it's such, like, the combination of silly in-joke and joy and just the ludicrousness of it, it just makes me laugh 
so much. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, that, that it's really funny because I didn't have any idea what the whole significance was of that. I just saw these guys walking with, you know, um, these they were dressed up, you know, in their pilot uniforms and they had ice cream makers. And I'm like going, what is up? Like, <laughs> <laughs> and so and so Mark Donovan, who's who is uh, the photographer that shot the video with me, he's actually in the 501st. And and I had met him at the previous celebration, he and his wife, and they both do fantastic cosplay. But he's a great photographer. And I saw some of his stuff and I said, will you go, you know, are you going to be there? Would, would you be interested in shooting some video with me? And he said, sure. So he and I were just kind of walking around, just taking random shots. And, you know, I had a playback speaker of the song and, and so we could do actual actual playback and get people dancing to it, um, which we ended up grabbing the Muppet Troopers, which was a lot of fun because I met them at the previous celebration and they knew me when I walked up. They were like, hey, Corey. And I was like, <laughs> you know, I don't know any of them personally because I usually see them with their heads on. So I have no idea who's underneath there. But <laughs> 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 so, so I'm like, yeah, you guys want to be in the video? They're like, yeah. <laughs> so we threw on the music they started dancing but we saw those guys coming through and I just sort of I said I just grabbed Mark and I said let's run and try and catch him and so we ran and I stood at the bottom of the escalator and as they were coming down and going back up they were just circulating circulating going down and coming back up going down <laughs> I just stood there <laughs> and I stuck my hand out and everybody started giving me high fives as they were going by on the escalator <laughs> because a lot of them recognized me and knew who I was, you know, and some of them might not have, but it was really hilarious. I mean, yeah. I, I also love it's like, if it wasn't for your dad, would still be on that cloud city. Thank him. Thank him for the warning. Our ice cream maker <laughs> wouldn't have made it out there. So yeah, just crazy things like that happened. And then, um, uh, we were able to get Mark Hamill to be in it, which I didn't think was possible because he's usually so busy at cons. And, you know, as, as so is my father, really busy. But, you know, I thought and I was talking to a few people and I said, you know, and I asked our manager, I said, do you think I can get Mark to be in it? And he was like, I really doubt it. <laughs> <laughs> but, but I was like, yeah, well, you know what? what you know, I'll try. So um, I saw him at the previous celebration and um, we took a picture together, he and Stephen and I, which was really nostalgic because I have a Polaroid of the three of us from the set of Return of the Jedi. And um, he was actually in his bathrobe and we kind of bum rushed his trailer and like took a Polaroid. <laughs> God. But um, <laughs> so, God, I, I I now really want to see this photo. <laughs> oh, it's pretty hilarious. If you, uh, I, it's on Facebook. You know, it's pretty all over the place on there. It's all, definitely on my Facebook. But yeah, we we had that, and so we you know we compared the two photos. It's pretty hilarious. But so while he was there, I thought you know there was one day where things were kind of winding down. We were kind of done shooting for the day, and. And um, his line was getting pretty short. You know, normally his line will go on for like hours. He'll just sit there and sign. And uh, but at that day, the day was winding down and he was kind of there. And I said, hmm. So I thought, well, probably none of these people are going to let me walk right up to him. But <laughs> but, uh, you know, a few of them recognized who I was. And and I said, you know, you, you think um I could ask one of Mark's people if he'd be interested in just doing a, like a little quick, you know, 30 second bit for this video we're doing. And the guy told me, well, why don't you walk up and ask him yourself? <laughs> so, so I'm thinking, OK, what I got to get a spiel together here. I, what am I going to say to Mark when I walk? Is he even going to recognize me, first of all? I don't even know who I am. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, so I'm thinking about how I'm going to explain myself and. There are a few fans there online, and I'm thinking, well, I don't want to jump in front of people who have been standing here for, you know, two hours trying to get his autograph. So I was trying to be respectful of them, and I'm standing off to the side, and one of the people in the front of the line kind of recognized me and said, Corey, can I take a picture with you? And I was like, sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then everybody kind of was real, real casual and relaxed about it, and so, you know, I walked up there to with him when he got ready to see Mark and Mark just looked up and said, Hey, 
how's your dad doing? I have laryngitis. And I was like, hey, Mark, you know, well, we're doing this little video. We just want you to do like what we call the Cloud City Point because we do this thing. It's like the Lando Point, mm -hmm. um, which is from an illustration that my friend Randy Martinez did, which you, a lot of people have seen the T-shirt. Stay classy, Cloud City. Ah, oh, yeah, that uh, that is an right? epic painting. Yeah, yeah. So he, you know, the artist is a friend of mine. So I, I said, well, I'm going to get him in the video as well. So he's actually in the video too. But we decided we were going to do this Lando Point would kind of be the theme of the whole video. And so I, I wanted to get Mark to do this Lando Point, and um, he said, yeah, I'll do it. He says, do I have to talk because I really my voice is gone. And I was like, no, no, Mark, you don't have to talk. All you have to do is point. So, <laughs> so he said, well, well, let's do it outside when I get ready to leave. And I said, okay, okay, we'll do that. So we rode in a golf cart with him, and um, he had to go do some things. And we we're waiting for him, and we thought, man, I hope he didn't ditch us. And like, <laughs> <laughs> the old leave him in the golf cart trick. <laughs> But yeah, but after about 15 minutes, we're getting kind of nervous. We think, oh man, is, is he really going to come out? And he comes out and he goes, yeah, let's do it. So, you know, he said, do you have the music? Can I hear it? So I start playing it back through the speaker and, it, and it's not coming out through the speaker. It's coming out through my phone. But he starts moving to the, to the music immediately. And I just told Mark, start videoing it as soon as he does anything. Just start shooting video. So we just shot the video. It was very spontaneous. And, and, you know, we're just dancing. Me and him are dancing together. And he just uh, reaches over and kisses me <laughs> on the forehead. And I really didn't know what to do. <laughs> so I just kissed him back. <laughs> so <laughs> it was pretty hilarious. I mean, how can you get anything more spontaneous than that in a video of that sort? I mean, it was crazy. And then and then we ran into Ray Park and he's such a cool guy. And he I said, if we could get you to do some lightsaber stuff in this and he was really such a good sport about it, man. He we ended up he had, he, had, he had actually happened to have a double lightsaber that day that someone had given to him of the makers of the saber, I think. And um, we got him in the in the back where it was kind of a little bit dark so you could see the lightsaber. And he started doing all these moves, man. And I had no idea that he could break dance and pop lock. And <laughs> Yeah, it was, it was quite strange to see Darth Maul do the lightsaber to the music. Like, it was like... A nightclubbing Sith Lord. He 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 had moves. He he, he was feeling he the beat. He does have moves, man. And he he kept wanting to do take after take. I mean, uh, you know, I thought, well, maybe we could get him to run through it one time. You know, that'd be great. And he really got into it, man. After the first take, he said, "Man, I'm warmed up now." I was like, well, <laughs> you want to do another one? <laughs> like, yeah. So I have so much great footage of him, you know, doing that. I decided to edit some of that video into the sequel, which we did, which is called The Beat Strikes Back. And um, that we actually shot at uh, Dragon Con this past uh, um, September. So Nice. On home turf. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, that was a little easier. and um, But Dragon Con is pretty chaotic, so you, do, you don't know what you're going to get when you go down there either. But um, I actually got a... Um, a friend of ours who's a hip hop artist, Sheen One, the MC, he wrote um, a rhyme, a rap to it. And, um, you know, I asked him to come down and be in the video as well as his brother who does the crunk. He does this character called the Crunk Jedi and um, Ron. And so they both came down and um, I got them to be in the video with us and as well as um, Eugene Strider, who's known as the hip hop trooper. He was in the first video too. I actually wanted to get him to do the majority of the first video with me, but um, he was ill on the day that we wanted to shoot. Um, and so he couldn't do it. And I said, man, for sure, I want to get more of you in this in the second video. And um, so we managed to grab him too. He's got a pretty huge following. He's pretty popular. Is, is, um, is he the red stormtrooper? 
Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. With, with the big champion logo around the necklace. Yeah, yeah, because champion, I think he's endorsing him now, but he's got the big gold chain, and it's just a fun, really fun character that he does, and he walks around with a big boom box, um, and, um, and which is called Bump Box, is a company that makes those boxes, but... Ah. Um, it's an awesome thing. He walks around with it and plays music. And I said, you know, can I get you to play the track? And he's like, sure. So um, during the first uh, video that we did for Cloud City Funk, we got him to play the track. And, and we actually walked through the convention with the track playing and people just sort of spontaneously dancing to it, which was a lot of fun. <laughs> and um, yeah, I mean, I even got Deep Roy to be in that thing, which Deep's been a friend of mine for a long time. But, you know, he my favorite role that he did was uh, he was one of the, he was all the Oompa Loompas actually in the in the remake of the Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. Ah, um, that's so who some, that was. I, I They look so familiar yeah, in the video. And I was like, who is that? He has some awesome dance moves, man. And he told me he was going to wear a white suit. I asked him if he'd be in the video. And he said, yeah, I want to be in the video. So he said, I'm going to wear this white suit and sunglasses. And I was like, you're kidding me. (laughs) That would be like perfect. (laughs) So we actually shot him at the video of him in the bar at the hotel because they had all these like multicolored lights. And I said, man, it's going to look like Saturday Night Fever or something, man. It's going to be so cool. (laughs) Now it, it would so, uh, so he it would be remiss of yeah. me not to compliment you. You do an excellent Mark Hamill with laryngitis. <laughs> it is it is spot on sore throat Hamill. You have nailed it. <laughs> I'm sure Mark will be impressed. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, wait, usually I get people wanting me to do like when I go and do Q and A's with my father, they always want him to do his a line, you know, from Star Wars or something, and he usually puts me on the spot and asks me to do something, you know. <laughs> and um, a few times I got really caught off guard, and I was like, <laughs> but then I started coming to know that he's going to do it, and then I would kind of get ready for it. But it was the scene between him and and um, Darth Vader and. Uh, you know, I said Lando Calrissian is the only person who's ever like yelled at Darth Vader and, and made it to the next scene. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> he, 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 He's like Lord Vader, Lord Vader. It wasn't the condition of our agreement, nor was given Han of that bounty hunter. <laughs> he goes, "You feel you're being treated unfairly." <laughs> he just shakes his head like, <laughs> "No." <laughs> Good. It would be unfortunate if I had to leave a garrison. <laughs> <laughs> now, I, I, I'm wondering, going way back, like, what was your first memory of Star Wars? Were you, were you into it before uh, your father was involved? Oh, yeah, definitely. I mean, we were, I was really excited when I found out he was going to be in the second movie and so was he i mean we were my whole family we were all like what you're gonna be in star wars you can't, you know <laughs> it's like you've arrived now you know forget all the hundreds of other movies you've done <laughs> like, <yeah. laughs> you know? i mean he's he's got a huge expansive career and he's done some great films and you know he was nominated for an emmy and uh for his work in um uh brian's song where mm-hmm. he played gil mm-hmm. sayers but I mean, and Lady Sings the Blues. So, I mean, he's done some really good stuff. And But Star Wars came along. It's like, wow, you're going you're gonna to be a... So, I, I think they kind of... I think he told me they kind of created that role around, you know, around using him. Because, you know, really, the character really fit him. I don't. I can't see anybody else. I mean, they're going to redo it and, and um, have Donald Glover doing it and stuff. But, you know, I just... It'll be a different thing. I just, it'll never be, you know, the same as when he does it because it's just, it's so much his persona is such a big part of what, what makes that character what it is. Yeah, it is like just his like charm and swagger that's sort of integrated right. with Lando Carizian. That mm-hmm. it's 
uh, this very intangible sort of thing. And it is, yeah. you know, Donald Glover's got. Man, like you know, they're, they're both. They're you know, you know yeah. The, the Hans. Well, he's a really he's a good actor, and you know he's, you know, he's probably what he's probably, and I'm sure you know they've probably they've had a conversation about it. But I'm I'm sure probably the best thing he could probably do is take it and make it his own thing. Don't try to do an imitation of you know Billy D. Williams in any kind of way because. <laughs> I wouldn't even want to be put, put, but, put in that situation. But, but it's, I, I think it's even extra hard because Billy D's done so many like really funny parodies of Lando, like on Robot Chicken and stuff. That True. Like he's also, not only is he the best Lando Carizian, he's also the best Lando Carizian like Parody. impersonator or parodier. Yeah, right. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he told me one time, he said, you know, I just, every time it's Lando, it's me. I mean, that's just the way it is. And, and you know, no matter what it is, if it's a a parody or what, I mean, even in the Lego movie, the whole the whole thing, you know, he's every time it's him. It's actually him. So, you know, I tell my friends that, like, Rob- oh, man, he was, Lando was on Robot Chicken. It's like, yeah, it was actually him. He was doing the voiceover. <laughs> So you're right. I mean, he's he's even the best Lando impersonator. <laughs> he's got it all covered. But what what is it like? You know, for for us, it's like, oh, how do you replace like Billy D. Williams as Lando Carizian? He was so good. He was perfect for the role. Can't imagine anyone else doing it. But what is it like for you, where it's like, oh, this dude's been recast as my dad. <laughs> Well, you know, I don't like, I don't, I wouldn't say anything negative about people or, you know, have anything bad to say about things. But, you know, that's, 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 a, those are, the, those are tough shoes to fill, man, in that, in that particular character. I mean, we'll see what happens, but, um, you know, it's just like, we've had discussions about it. I mean, people wanted, wanted, really wanted him to come back in those, in those films and, they didn't choose to bring his character back, which is kind of a shame because fans really want it. They still want it. But, um, you know, as time goes on, it's less and less of a chance of it actually occurring, I guess. But, um, you know, there, there, he, there is only one Lando, man. I'm sorry. I mean, <laughs> and I'm not just saying that, you know, because he's my dad. But, you know, if <laughs> It's 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 a it's a tough one. That's a tough one, man. I mean, it'd be like somebody trying to trying to be Luke Skywalker or Han Solo. You know, it's just they're those are iconic characters, man. It is tough that and are associated with the people that play them. You know, pretty heavily. So, and I loved the such a good photo. There was a photo of Donald <clears throat> Glover and your dad having lunch somewhere and yeah chatting about yeah. Lando like that like like for fans to see you know yeah. the, the original having lunch with the guy that's going to try do it it's it's it's, yeah. it's something about that's very exciting yeah it's kind of like the nod you know it's like the passing of the torch kind of thing <laughs> yeah or it's some weird like <laughs> looper or back to the future thing where you're like <laughs> Like a, a Lando off. Oh. <laughs> uh, you know, Lando, the character, Cal- Lando Calrissian, is a, you know, and Pops is a pretty charismatic dude, man. I mean, you can't, you can't fake that kind of charisma. You either, you have it or you don't. I mean, you know, and a lot of that stuff is, you know, it's just hereditary. I mean, my grandfather was like one of the coolest guys on the planet. I mean, you know, he was he was a Texan. He was from Texas, but you know, and uh, but he was just a real cool guy. Yeah. And you saw him dressed up in a suit. You'd think he was like you know lived in the city all he was all his life, but he was he was a country boy. You know, growing up. So I mean that that coolness is just a thing, and you know, I guess I guess there are, there are a lot of other people who have it in their family too. But you know, it's it's. It's a hard thing to fake. <laughs> that's that's all I'm saying. Right, right. <laughs> well, I, I, I remember seeing him at the 40th anniversary panel at Celebration, and you know, just him just sitting there, it exuded like 
just something. It was just like yeah. <laughs> he's just got this glow or this charisma that it, it was. It's... So um, I, I hope you've learned how to harness that, uh, Corey. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's uh, it's tough. It's a tough. That's a tough uh, order there, man. <laughs> so, so what was it like going back? You, you're probably maybe a bit older uh, to to feel the heat. But what was it like that your father is in the new Star Wars film, and then he turns out to be a, a little bit less reputable than uh, fans would have hoped? Yeah. <laughs> How was that to deal with back in the eighties? <laughs> Well, he would tell me stories about, you know, he went through it. I never, you know, experienced anybody saying anything negative, but he would tell me stories about having to, like, take my little sister to school and, like, how other kids would come up to him and go, why why did you betray Han Solo? You know, like, <laughs> you know, they're mad at him and stuff. He's like, wait a minute, like... <laughs> You know, I turned it around. You know, you have to explain yourself to a you know, <laughs> to an eight year old or something. You know, that the, the the thought of him getting hassled by like an eight year old and just yeah. like having to go, Darth Vader, he made the deal worse. Have you not seen yeah. the film? Right. I did my best. Right. Exactly. <laughs> He was, a, he was a character that was put into a situation. But, you know, he redeemed himself. He ended up blowing up the Death Star and and later on in the following movie and, like, being instrumental in, in their battle against the Empire in, in, um, in the long run. So, you know, it, he, he really obviously ended up being a good guy. But there was a, but there was a moment there where it could have gone either way. I mean, you know. It's kind of hard to, can you imagine, you know, saying no to Lord Vader? I mean, you're not, <laughs> <there's> not <laughs> you, you, you would probably be really tempted to go along with whatever program it was or, or pretty much die. <laughs> you know? Yeah. I, but again, I want to see that conversation where he's going to the little kid just like, all right, well, what have you stood up to Darth Vader about, huh? Right. Yeah? Yeah, right. How would you like it, buddy? <laughs> yeah, I mean, he would be able to tell you. I've heard him tell stories about that. It's pretty hilarious, you know, the way he tells it. I can't tell it the way he does because I didn't have the experience. I wasn't there, but you can imagine how funny it must have been. Uh, and it's uh, what he's been going through. I mean, it, it's it it just it just reads like a sketch, right? <laughs> like the the Billy D. Williams episode of Curb Your Enthusiasm. Totally. Totally. <laughs> the uh, one of the, the the little things that he did that was sort of weird at the time, I, I guess maybe, but I just love it so much now. Like it's one of these weird, bizarre things in Star Wars. Is in the closing shot when he's at the Ewok party, and he's mm-hmm. like clapping, looking around. I just, yeah. for some reason, I love that so much that he's just yeah. like. These Ewoks know how to party. Yes. Right, right. This is going to be a big night on Endor. <laughs> I can picture it when you, I can picture it in my head when you're saying that. It's hilarious. <laughs> That's pretty funny, man. Yeah. Uh, I probably if I had gone, I would have been a stand-in in that shot, you know, I would have been there which, you know, would have been really funny, but uh, yeah, I mean, that's actually how I ended up stunt doubling him in part of the scene where he goes over the edge in the, over the Sarlacc pit. He's So the actual, the actual stuntman, Julius LaFleur, did the actual swing over, and then in segments of it where he's actually hanging there in the distance, it's me hanging there dressed as Lando Calrissian. Because uh, his stunt guy is doing other stunts in the same shot. And then also he got injured. He injured his foot. Um, during the during uh, one of the segments where the tentacle goes up to grab his foot and Han shoots it, there's a, a, a charge that they call a squib that goes off, and the squib actually went off, and when it went off, it burned his toe. And then at that point, they were like, well, why don't we, we don't really want to put 
billion any more uncomfortable, dangerous situations than we have to. <laughs> yeah. I know. How about you, Corey? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, yeah, what do I have to do? You know, so I had martial arts training. I was really fit. Very, you know, I've been fit most of my life. And I was like, it was just a physical challenge to me. I'm just like, yeah, whatever. What? Yeah, let's do it. But I had no idea, you know, what it was going to be like until it started happening. You know, these explosions are going off and I'm feeling the heat from the explosions. And the guy who's doubling Chewbacca is sort of smoldering from ambers that are hitting him. And I'm like, God, man, I, I love that. <laughs> it's on fire. It's going to take them a long time to come and put us out. <laughs> yeah. They, they, they like go to your dad. Is this your only child? No. And he goes, well, how would you like to do the stunt then? <laughs> You've got spare kids at home. It's fine. <laughs> well, you know, it wasn't. It wasn't. It wasn't as dangerous as probably some of the other things that people had to do. But there was a, <laughs> certainly an element of danger and certainly an element of surprise to it when they put. And especially when you're in a really uncomfortable harness that you know this kind of pulling you all in the wrong all all in the wrong places in the middle section if you know what I mean. <laughs> you you're hanging upside down on that harness just like I just wish I could just put my apron back on it was it was so yeah, much simpler than I'd rather then. wear an apron <laughs> <laughs> All right, Corey, as I mentioned before, the Sarlacc pit battle, Luke Skywalker about to get thrown into the Sarlacc pit, free us or die, Jabba calls his bluff, and then he just says to R2-D2, throw us over that lightsaber and ignite the green, saves the day, blows up the sail barge. It, it's it's so magic for me. I, I, I do have to say one thing before we get into this is... Lando Carizian, I, I don't know if you've ever spoken to your father about how to stay in disguise or whatever, but the camera's on him in Jabba's palace, and he and he just pulls down his mask to reveal who he is. Now, he has to stay, <laughs> like, he doesn't have a beard on under there or anything, so I, I'm not sure if you can discuss this with him, but he, he has to be more incognito, don't you think? <laughs> Well, nobody was expecting to see him in there, you know, and, you know, it was just kind of a surprise, you know. Well, they had to, re- he had to reveal himself to the to the audience, otherwise he'd be like, who's this dude with the, you know, bones on his face? <laughs> the bones. <laughs> I, I, to his credit, he didn't wink at the camera. I, I thought that was... Uh... <laughs> That would have made it perfect. <laughs> that, that's, that, that'd be very Billy D. But I... I, I you just, should have been the director on that one. <laughs> yeah, maybe. I don't think I could deal with George Lucas looking over my shoulder the whole time and get <laughs> wearing a flannel. It's a hot day. It, it just bother me. But um, in making that that iconic scene of Luke Skywalker getting the lightsaber, doing the the forward flip, grabbing it, and, and cleaning house. Um, do you recall them filming that? Just little things like, you know, R2-D2 with the lightsaber sticking out. Was there like, and, and what was it like to watch it sort of come together? Like, could, could you sort of work out w- which way the plot was going with that? Well, you know, I was watching it from various angles on different days. And so, you know, you, you know, it, everything isn't, when they shoot, it's not necessarily in the correct order. So all of these things are sort of out of order and you're not really sure how all of this is going to piece together. But, you know, he's, he springboards, you know, off of that plank. And then, um, you know, that's one cut. And then you might have a stunt double do a flip and that's another cut. And then, you know, you might have him landing on the deck, which is another cut. So, you know, basically... As Clad 2, I was up on the deck a good portion of that moment in the scene, but um, there was also times where I was actually inside the inner workings of uh, of uh, Java's sail bar just looking out at what was going on. I actually took some behind-the-scenes shots from inside there, and you can look. I was looking right down uh, to the skiff, and then I had a couple of shots that I took looking 
from one of the cannons, right down one of the cannons that was on the deck oh, towards nice. the skiff. Nice. So this is some cool, you know, behind the scenes shots that I took from up there. But yeah, you kind of, you know, I kind of got to see different things from different vantage points. And like I said, I wasn't really absolutely sure how all that was going to come together. But um, yeah, you're right. It is a pretty kind of amazing scene in a moment in the in the film, which is, you oh, know, oh, made, no, no, to even more I, important, more significant. <laughs> I, I, ju- I just have to pull you up there. It, it's not like amazing or great. It, it's the best thing that has ever been projected onto a giant white wall okay <laughs> okay I'm, I'm very serious okay, about this Corey okay. I'm very serious <laughs> okay okay that there is there is that is we're not gonna come to blows over it are we <laughs> oh we're gonna come to something buddy we're gonna come to something <laughs> Was there anything in that scene that you remember getting filmed that maybe didn't make the final cut? Well, that would probably be a lot of the accidents that occurred. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there there are a lot of, uh, you know, flubs when you're doing stunts like that. Some, sometimes you have to do it more than once. Sometimes you, you hope it comes out right the first time. But actually, um, one of the things that happened was um, Julius LaFleur, who was... Act my dad's actual stunt double. He did all the difficult stuff. Like actually, when the explosion happens and he goes flying over the side, that's actually Julius. And so they put you in a safety harness that has a cable, and the cable is there to keep you from, you know, when you go over the side. You, he's grabbing onto these cable wires, dangling over the side, but the cable on the harness is there as a safety, so that you don't end up, you know, falling all the way into the pit. Well, what happened was there was a guy who um, one of the other characters that he was tussling with and they're supposed to go over the side together, but the other guy's supposed to let go of him and then fall into the pit. So, you know, the timing had to be just perfect for him to sort of, as they're both going over the side together, then sort of let go of him as they're falling and um, just in time. So, but what happened was the cable... um, that was there as a safety couldn't support both their weight. And um, Julius had his hand across that cable. And then when the, uh, when they went over the side, the cable snapped in his hand basically and pretty much sliced his hand wide open. Mm-hmm. And then they both fell into the, to the side of the pit and slid down into the hole. And uh, he landed on the other stunt guy's leg and the guy had his leg broken. So it was, uh, he had a broken, one guy had a broken leg, the other had his hands sliced wide open. And um, they were, you know, trying to crawl out of the bottom once they hit, you know, with their injuries, they're trying to crawl out through the bottom because you basically had to come out through a tunnel that was underneath the set. Man, so, that, that Sarlacc yeah. was not playing. No, I mean, that was, that was a wicked scene. I mean, when you think about it, I mean... Uh, Accidents happen in stunts, you know, pretty regularly. I mean, that stuff happens. But, um, you know, when you're dealing with that much action in one scene all at one time, because so much stuff is going on simultaneously. So, like, even, you know, like I ended up being the double for my father, like I explained to you earlier, but um, it was because Julius was actually doing a fall into the pit. Mm Mm-hmm as one of the other characters, which he probably was maybe two or three, maybe different characters in that scene, depending on what, what angle you see it from. Yeah. Gotcha. (laughs) But there's actually a photo that my father took of me dangling over the side and Julius in midair, basically falling into the pit. Oh, yeah. It's it's pretty cool. in that one, I've actually, I think I've seen that cast. I think Stephen Sansweet at Rancho Obi Wan has that cast, and it's got uh-huh. it's got the autographs from everyone on set, from you know George oh. Lucas and Mark Hamill, and 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 maybe there's a Corey D autograph on there somewhere. You never know. <laughs> I get around a little bit. What about the actual the, the the catching of the lightsaber? Now th- this like this is my favorite thing ever in the history of ever. The the moment he captures 
the lightsaber or the moment he catches the lightsaber, looks at it, gets a little sly grin and then turns it on. Do, do you recall seeing that one get filmed, Corey? Um, at that moment, I was probably in Klaatu's costume and more than likely had that head on. And when you have that head on, you're not seeing much of anything. I mean, Damn it, Corey! <laughs> I need more basically, information. Basically, they had to point me in the right direction and say, you know, they're like, okay, here's what you're supposed to do. You're going to run towards Luke Skywalker. He's going to cut your weapon in half. You're going to turn around and you're going to go back. Okay. And I'm like, okay, so which way do you want me to run again? <laughs> so I can't. Where is he? And, and, we and, wonder you know, why, and we wonder why people are getting hurt on set. Uh, and you're dealing with, you know, there's a you're up like three, four stories in the air and there are no guardrails up there. I mean, you know, if you run toward the edge of the ship, you could, you could be going down quite a ways, falling, doing some falling, doing a free fall. But so, yeah, it was it was pretty tricky up there. I mean, you had to make sure it was very well coordinated and you really had to know uh, what what you were doing and when you were doing it. and but yeah, it was almost impossible to see in that thing. I mean, you could see a little bit through those eyes that, and maybe breathe slightly. <laughs> they actually would open it up and put a hair dryer, you know, and, and blow air up into it in between takes just so we could, like, get a little bit of oxygen. And then, you know, they'd say, you know, action, and then you'd run and do your thing. With wispy <laughs> hair. Yeah. <laughs> he didn't, I don't think he had any hair. He had a, he had a helmet. Um, Clad too had a helmet anyway, but Steven, you know, when they put him in the Gamorrean guard outfit, we had to actually pick him up because the, the costume was so heavy when he was sitting down resting that he had to have help getting up. It's <laughs> so much latex, you know, you had to put on on that thing. Wow. Well, uh, you know, you didn't get to see it, but uh, they did film it, lucky enough. They did film it all. They did they? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh man, Corey! Thanks so much for uh, sharing all your stories. It's uh, cool. it's so cool, and I, I think it's so cool that the way that you've sort of integrated yourself into the fan community, and you know, yeah. you're sort of getting a part of that. And I, as I said, it, it made me a little bit celebration homesick when I was watching the video, and mm. you know, seeing people have such fun and stuff like the conventions are just little little weekends of of bliss and fun now one thing we like to know from all our guests where now more than ever especially in the last week we have got endless star wars stories you know they're going to be going on until who knows when right What, what would you like most to see happen in the star wars universe in all this storytelling that's uh going to be taking place Hmm, that's a tough one. You know, I'm I'm just I'm looking forward to seeing where they're going to take it, you know, and I know they're trying to connect the old with the new right now still. Um you know, aside from the movie that when they went back and did the prequel. But um but now they they're really I guess they're going to try to connect everything with where they want to go with it next and I'm just curious to see and like all the other fans where it's going to go next. I'm not, you know, you, you really have to sort of let go of what it was. I mean, people start to really become too critical of it all. I think sometimes and scrutinize it more than maybe necessary, but I think we just have to be open to whatever it's going to become. Nothing will ever sort of diminish the value of the original films or, change any of that i mean those are what they are and they'll always continue to be what they are but um but it would be interesting to see where it goes in the future because it's such a fun saga and it's and it's unusual in the fact that it's continued for so long and it'll probably like you said go on forever infinitely i mean we'll be gone and the next generation of people will be into it so it's sort of special in that way and it's um I think it will always continue to be special. 
Right on. And we've had we've had no indication what happens to Lando Carizian after Return of the Jedi. Like, do you think we're going to get some some closure with uh, one of the most uh, beloved characters? I wish. <laughs> 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 you know, I you know, if they feel like it's important enough, I think it's important to the fans. Um, I think everybody would like to see it. I mean, that would be a really cool thing. I, I don't know what they're going to do with this, you know, movie with the character, you know, how they're going to, where they're going to take the character. I've always wanted, you know, Lord Vader is like one of my all time favorite characters. And I've always wanted them to like, you know, it wasn't, he was, he would just sort of walk in and out of the movie and, and steal the scene, you know, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm-hmm. I, would, I would love to see. A movie, you know, not the saga was really about him more or less anyway, and Anakin. But I, you know, I'd like to see more adventures of Vader in the future or something. Man, that'd be fun. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, as you saw at the end of Rogue One, the the, the dude can go. Yeah, <laughs> right. <laughs> he can go exactly. Wow. But yeah, they they really they didn't put a lot of him in there. They they used him. They 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 used him as a teaser, you know. It's like, ah, oh, yeah, Vader's gonna be in this one again, you know. There's, he's like the biggest, baddest villain of all times. I don't think there's anybody. There are no better villains on the planet than him, man, yeah. <laughs> or in the universe, I should say. Yeah. <laughs> now, whenever they do any of those like greatest villains of all time, you know, the yeah. the the Dark Lord's normally pretty close uh-huh. to the top. Man, no one, no, no one can top him as far as I'm concerned. He just there's so much power there and strength, man. Now, uh, where can the good people of the internet track you down and and, and catch the uh, the Cloud City Funk? Um, well, you know, our website is sort of the hub to everything that we do. We're on Facebook, we're on Instagram, um, we're on YouTube. We're, uh, it's 3dnucleus.com. 3 D E E nucleus and um, the number three. So, yeah, I mean, that's 3dnucleus.com. You can go there. Um, we also at 3D Nucleus Project on Facebook and at 3D Nucleus on Instagram. And, um, you know, we also have a YouTube channel. So, I mean, we're, we're pretty much everywhere. It's going to be, if you Google me, you'll probably see something related to it. But, but yeah, I mean, you can definitely go to our website. And um, it'll point you in all directions. Nice. Well, there'll definitely be a link to the YouTube videos in the podcast show notes. So uh, if you're listening to this on your phone right now, just scroll down a little bit and there'll be a link and that will take you directly to those clips that they're super fun. And it, it does sort of capture the like the the bizarre circus that is a Star Wars convention with the costume characters yes. and, and, and people <laughs> the, like the one thing I love about the conventions is just like you're talking about your friend. That's the, the hip hop trooper is the way people take their interests and then mash it with star Wars and express themselves at the conventions. It's, yeah, it's, it's a real special thing. I think it is, man. And it's fun to watch. And, you know, especially if you're any kind of star Wars fan and, you know, and even if you're not, it's entertaining, but yeah, I mean, it's just, it's really cool to go out there and then shoot video and be a part of all of that enthusiasm towards what's happening in it and what we do in it and all that. It's just a, it's a cool thing. So the videos are fun, you know, they're fun to watch and, um, you know, we've done two of them so far. We will probably do more. I'm sure, you know, we'll see what we can come up with next, but, but yeah, it was, it was a blast. All right. Well, I am, uh, the next time you're at a convention that I'm there, I, I, I want to do some pointing. I want to get my funk. Yeah, on. man. We, if I, if I had known you when I was, at, when I was at celebration that time, we would have probably stuck you in there. Dude, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll kiss you far more passionately than Mark <laughs> Hamill did. Okay. That's my promise. <laughs> I'll throw you down, man. <laughs> <laughs> so are you going to edit this thing down to about 20 minutes? But nah, man. <laughs> People actually listen to a whole hour and a half podcast. How dare you? <laughs> How dare you? <laughs> yes. Corey, thank you so much. And may that force be with you.
Same to you, my friend. Thank you for having me. Hey, you guys. Thanks for listening to such a fun chat with Corey D. Williams on our 150th episode ever. And very apt that we get to talk to someone on the 150th that was there for the filming of my favorite scene when Luke Skywalker ignited that green. Ah, nothing like it. Nothing like it. Now, while it is our 150th episode, there are about, I think, 320 episodes, including all the bonuses, in our Patreon feed. And it's only been with listener support that we've been able to record all these episodes, and it can only continue with it. So, on this prestigious 150th episode week. If you want to throw in $3 to support the podcast for the month and test out the Steel Wars Patreon Content Club. All the episodes, full length, 150 plus all the bonus episodes, you can go back in time. And uh, I think we've really built up a, a great collection of pretty timeless Star Wars interviews. There'll be a few things that, you know, looking forward to The Force Awakens, whatever, but for the majority, the interview episodes uh, can be listened to at any moment in your Star Wars fandom. And it is super simple to sign up. Just $3 and you get an RSS feed and any episode that you want will be delivered to your podcast app of choice, just like any other podcast. And all the new episodes download without any mid-episode interruptions or advertisements. So it's straight through. You can check that out at patreon.com forward slash Steel Wars. And, and just of late, our two Making Steel Wars episodes where Jason Ward and I try to work out what scenes go where in the teaser and trailer has uh, people been loving those so uh, it's not too spoilery but uh, we just try to work out where stuff goes and I- I've got you know to be honest no idea what happens in the last I don't know 20 minutes of the film but people have been really enjoying that other things on the feed that you may have missed whether you are a patreon subscriber or not we've got another episode of our dysfunctional Skywalker family panels that Chris Gore hosts at Comic Cons around America. This one's from LA Comic Con, and it is super funny going into the dysfunctional qualities of that Skywalker family. Also on the feed, if you are free or Patreon, we've got a new Struthers Wars, where Eric Struthers, who's been such a great supporter of the podcast, I must say, from the Bad Motivators podcast, he interviews a Patreon supporter each month about their fandom and and their favorite Steel Wars moments. So it's a good way to uh, hear a great chat and hear some classic clips that we've recorded over the years from Steel Wars. And also a good breaking off point if you want to know what episodes to go check. A lot of people subscribe to the Patreon and they're like, oh my God, where do I start? There's just so much content! <laughs> There really is, actually. I've recorded a lot of Star Wars conversations. Speaking of content, my other podcast, I Love Green Guide Letters, where we review the complaint letters to the Australian TV Guide, has a really popular new episode up with the boys from the Weekly Planet, Meso and Mr. Sunday Movie. So there is a lot of nerd talk wedged in there. So if you have not listened to I Love Green Guide Letters before, this is a really good crossover episode to check out. It is pure joy that I get to do this for you a couple times a week. So thank you guys so much. Here's to another 150, you guys. And may that force be with you.
This podcast is part of the Planet Broadcasting Network. Visit planetbcasting.com for more podcasts from our great mates. I mean, if you want. It's up to you. Also, for more Star Wars podcasting, check out the Making Star Wars Podcast Network at makingstarwars.net.